I want to sort of jump off of uh, one of the comments that um, uh, that Chayton made, which is that um, in, in general, people don't want to be monitored. And uh, one of the comments from Ewan that monitoring people all the time, and uh, uh, from uh, Marco that monitoring uh, devices all the time would certainly uh, you know, save us a tremendous amount of heartache and, and uh, have economic uh, impact. So I want to ask you what I call the sort of black mirror question. Okay, so for those of you who, who are fans of science fiction, you know, the television show Black Mirror, anyone here seen the TV show Black Mirror? It's a wonderful sort of near dystopian future that's eerily like the world in which we live in, uh, in which technology sort of integrated seamlessly into life for both bad and mostly bad in the TV show, but also for good. So I want you to give me sort of the highbrow X-Men version or Avengers version of how technology that we're talking about here for sensing is going to make the world better, and then sort of your Black Mirror concern version, and, and maybe we can uh, start with Yuri and, and work our way through. So, uh, thing that you're most excited about, thing you're most worried about when it comes to sensing and, and AI. Uh, sure. So I'm, I, I mean, I'm really excited, and I think like especially like you and Stock and and, and Marcos, right, kind of showed um, the 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 possibility for for this technology, how it can really make difference and and change human lives. Uh, with you and we are now uh, working on a project about trying to understand how to incentivize and kind of interrupt people to make them more physically active, and how to use gamification and and interruptions and things like that to 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 make them uh, do a few steps, right? And I think in some sense this. Um, Sensing, you can think of it as, as creepy, but I think it's all a question of incentives and the value provided to the uh, to the people, right? So, um, and again, in this kind of health applications, it's clear that the, the value that people are being provided, either trying to lose weight, be more physically active, or you know, detecting um, various kinds of symptoms and diseases. Um, now, uh, where where uh, things are like, what is what is scary? I think uh, what is scary is abuse. Right is if I think we are not careful and and ethical about how we are um, using this data, why are we using it for, and how it you know benefits people, customers, and the society, then we get the backlash. Uh, and you know, a few weeks ago we saw some examples of this backlash. Um, so maybe that's all I'd say. Yeah. Um, so I, the, on the positive side, I think. There's there's a bright future ahead, a, a white mirror or whatever that might be. I mean, I think that you know there is so much that we need to learn in healthcare from really other uh, technologies and other other sectors. Uh, it's routine now for us to expect that an algorithm will watch our credit card for activity for fraud. We we take that for granted and we get a text message if that happens and we are you know mostly fine with that and it's probably saved me thousands of dollars for those kind of alerts. But there's no similar alert for some, if my heart starts to go off. There's, there's no similar alert for if my gait starts to change a little bit because I have early stage Parkinson's disease. And I think that in healthcare, we've just been very scared of that. We've been very scared of measuring things for the want of, of false positives. And I think we need to learn in healthcare from statisticians and from our computer science colleagues and people who are, who are used to dealing with those kind of errors. And we need to get, to get used to that, that because the, the benefit is potentially incredible. Like we're looking at a world where we really could prevent disease. There are many examples. I put a few up there just in the cardiac domain. You know, I could pick up the pulmonary domain or the GI domain or the neurology and we could, we could have another list the same size. So there's, I think, huge opportunity. And then uh, Black Mirror is an amazing show, uh, and, but it's scary. It's not, you know, if you want to be affected for days after watching your TV show, it's a good one to watch. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, um, he, Charlie Brooker, I think, isn't it, right? So he's just, just I, he would be an interesting guy to sit down with. But, I mean, clearly, in, in every single one of these signals is the potential to identify someone. And um, George Church, one of, of Carlos and I's colleagues, who's a, a geneticist at Harvard, has this example uh, where, when you sign up for studies relating to the, uh, giving your DNA and, and showing people worry about DNA and the identifiability, identifiability of it. His, and his consent form literally says, you should be aware if you sign up for the study that someone might take your sequence, that we have sequenced as part of the study, generate synthetic DNA and plant it at a crime scene. I mean, basically, that's a black mirror scenario right there. 
I mean, and he's now talking about the fact that you, he could take enough DNA from the air that you breathe out to be able to get a few cells enough to identify you from, from ID. So, you know, I think there is a, a if, I mean, in a, in a truly dystopian uh, future, there are ways that all these signals could be intercepted and used for bad. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, I hope that doesn't happen because I think there are ways that society has from protecting us from it, but recent events and, uh, you know, we don't need to look too far to see that it can, it can go wrong. So. Thank you. Well, focusing on mobility systems, uh, I think uh, what I'm really excited about is that we have uh, an opportunity for the first time since the invention of the automobile to really change how we access mobility. Uh, for 100 years, the main paradigm was that you own your car, you maintain it, you don't use it 95% of the time, so you have an asset that is, that is sitting there just depreciating, and uh, you spend a lot of time commuting. While with these new systems, at least in principle, we may be able to have a, a better mobility at a reduced price. That's the hope. On the other hand, we already see cases whereby uh, new forms of mobility, not uh, without self-driving vehicles, just with the traditional vehicles, like for example, Uber and Lyft, are creating negative externalities. As I said before, in New York City, dramatic increase of uh, congestion, or in other neighborhoods in the United States, uh, some public transit uh, lines have been uh, cancelled because they were no longer economically feasible because they were competed by Uber, Lyft, or similar uh, systems. So to me, it's all a matter of equitability. Transportation is one of the most important infrastructure in our society. It is far from being equitable right now. We have an opportunity to make it more equitable, but at the same time, we might get it wrong. We might make uh, transportation better for some, but much worse for a significant chunk of the population. That's really my worry. So I'm not saying that uh, sensing is bad. <laughs> but I think, uh, as I've, we talked about in several use cases, say elderly healthcare, uh, medicine, I think sensing, personal sensing, can have a lot of beneficial effects. My point, though, was that we have to be cognizant of trade-offs and the costs thereof. Um, and people often talk about autonomy, uh, autonomous vehicles, but we have to think about human autonomy too. And there is a trade-off between human autonomy and, and inefficiency. So we can make systems a lot efficient by having a central command and control, but then you lose autonomy. So as you sense more and more, the temptation to have systems that are very centrally uh, optimized, so to speak, uh, goes up. And that is something that we have to guard against as society. So, Thank you. No, and, and I thought it was actually a very insightful point on your part about how we look to strike that balance between the abilities and the great powers that are going to come from sensing and the responsibility to, to deploy correct. Uh, following up on that, and, and actually, Marco, your, your point on the societal implications, I really love that sort of last sixth of your slide that you had there on the interacting network between autonomous mobile robots, the societal infrastructure, societal control, societal relations, and, and the whole notion that these technologies are going to have societal implications. Um, and, and in particular on a theme that uh, resonates actually from your, your work on um, the inactivity inequality or the Gini coefficient for activity. Um, what role do you think, if any, the sort of sensor technology and AI built on top can have in addressing, uh, say, inequalities or disparities or differences either in how we deliver healthcare, how we uh, organize infrastructure. Do you see a role? Um, and if so, how do we think about those issues? And we can start uh, with anybody who wants to start. Marco, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, so of course, um, I truly believe that actually is a big opportunity, the fact that we can now centrally coordinate a fleet of vehicles. But to do so, we need all these advanced tools from uh, the field of uh, data science and decision-making, if you will, artificial intelligence, uh, um, um, and so on. Um, but as I said before, the societal implications are uh, significant. Uh, I just want to give you some other examples. If we change the way we access mobility, we can dramatically change the values of uh, um, real estate. And so some people might get 
better off and some people might get uh, worse off. There are some estimates that estimate this change in uh, the number of trillions of dollars. Um, but on the other hand, um, if you think of how much time uh, mankind sp spends in uh, commuting, the fact that we can use that time for something else is an enormous positive societal externality. So I think the crux of the problem is really trying to understand how by exploiting the data and exploiting the algorithms, we can really incentivize positive externalities and disincentivize negative externalities. So that's why I have now this project with a number of uh, uh, colleagues also in the humanities and so on. First of all, we have to understand what those externalities are. Currently, they are not clear. Two, we want to understand what our uh, um, levers are, both from an algorithmic standpoint and from a policy standpoint. And then we have to uh, have a public debate about possible future scenarios and how we can influence them. It's a challenge, but... I mean, if, I, if I think about it, and I'll steal your white mirror, <laughs> I, I like that. Um, sort of white mirror solution that you could enable is sort of ma mass transit at scale through distributed networks, right? So if, if we think about the challenge of public transportation, so I, I spent a lot of time in Miami. I'm from Miami, big city, big urban sprawl. You want to get anywhere, the last thing you do is, is go on a large scale public transportation. You have to take three buses to go anywhere. But if I had a distributed network of autonomous vehicles, boy, sort of workforce logistics now becomes uh, neutralized. People can get almost anywhere in South Florida and get to any job, and you enable now a whole uh, movement of people that otherwise might get locked into you know their regional neighborhoods if they don't have a car or something like that. Yeah, but for example, uh, some companies, uh, my favorite part of me, whereby you have a point-to-point -point transportation because it could be more financially advantageous, or by centrally coordinating a fleet of vehicles in an effort to reduce congestion, you might try to use uh, roads that are not normally used. For example, sec secondary roads uh, in uh, uh, residential neighborhoods and so on. And my people might get uh, really uh, pissed off by the fact that now they see a lot of traffic to the point that currently some of residential neighborhoods are trying to um, have other artificial barriers <laughs> to avoid that vehicles go through those roads. So you see how uh, there are a lot of uh, competing interests at play. Now, it, it, this is a current problem. It's not like a problem that we have in 30 years ago. And I don't think we still have an understanding of what all these factors of play are, one, and two, let alone how to influence them in a positive manner. Yuri, do you want to address the issue of inequality and how sensors might help there? Uh, yeah, sure. So, yeah, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Like, before it worked and now it doesn't. Okay, now it works. Um, so, a few things. I think, like, these technologies are amazingly powerful and they allow us to do things better and more efficiently. And I think... Um, and basically, in some sense, allow us to do decision making at a much more fine, fine grained resolution, right? And you know, this can be anything from managing the fleets of self driving cars to any kind of predictive maintenance and things like that, where you can really try to make things efficient. But I think they also can happen at the level of the society, at, at, in a sense of um, personalization and kind of really trying to come up with personalized treatments. And treatments, I mean, just kind of at a set of interventions. And you can think of this at the level of, of health, right? Every one of us is different, but kind of the, um, uh, the treatments are not necessarily personalized to the level we, we, would, wanna, we would want them to be. Um, and another, for example, one project we, we are just starting and yesterday we gave a presentation about is we are trying to apply and think about this notion of personalization when you, when you try to fight poverty, right? And traditionally poverty was thought of as this kind of one type of disease, homogeneous, but if you actually kind of go out, measure and collect data, you realize that there are many different types of poverty. Right, for various different kinds of uh, social psychological reasons, to can any kind of structural uh, reasons, and so on. Right, but if you can kind of identify these types, 
build, let's say, predictive models that will tell you what is for a given individual the risk for them to be in any of these different types of poverty, then you can really start also to personalize interventions. And you can say, aha, uh -huh, you know, for this type, for this person, it's the, the job skills retraining that I will apply. Aha, uh -huh, but here I will come with a, a housing voucher. And here I will come, you know, with some food stamps because, you know, this is this type of poverty due, due to, I don't know, childhood, childhood trauma or due to substance abuse versus because of deindustrialization or lack of jobs and so on. So I think there is a lot kind of machine learning data science can help um, across this kind of field. I think the other place where uh, it actually helps reduce inequality is especially in developing countries around uh, governance and environment. So the, the richer the leader in society are able to have access to better governance and environment. But with much more uh, sensing of the environment, the poorer people can uh, reflect that, saying that, look, our environment is not as healthy as someone else's. And that can lead to uh, positive changes. So this sort of inequality in terms of environment and governance can also be addressed with sensing. So uh, I'd like to open it up uh, to the audience for, for questions. Uh, in, in the meantime, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with, with one last one that, that I'd love to get your thoughts on. Um, how do we see um, academic and industrial partnerships of the type that, that we, you've all discussed actually here and that we're participating in, sort of lowering the, the barriers to deploying these technologies to scale? So we incubate great ideas inside the university, but as you, you, know, you would beautifully illustrate we really want to get them out uh, quickly. What role do you see for these kinds of partnerships in, in doing this, and, and what do you see as the most effective way of, of, of enabling this? And maybe we'll start with you, you and, yeah. uh, in, 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 uh, in Happy to do that. I mean, I, I think it's, it's never been done any other way. I mean, I think that uh, I, the universities can, can play a role in, in trying things out that are, that are risky. Uh, but the university, and we, we have a healthcare system uh, that we think of increasingly as a kind of live lab for testing these, these new, and, and most of the patients who come are happy for that to be the case. Uh, but if we want to affect 30 million people in one go, that's not, Stanford healthcare system isn't, isn't going to do that. I think we can prove that it's possible. Uh, we can you know, be partnership with the idea, uh, develop together, uh, continue the partnership through what we think of in, in the pharma world as a phase one, but you know, the first pilot study, if you like, get it into 100 people or maybe even 1,000. And then it has to go out in the world. And I think that's where it, it has to be industry. Uh, that, that's the way the world is. And so I think that the, this opportunity to impact really large numbers of people beyond the uh, borders is what's actually new and really exciting. I mean, just part of, of, uh, of the last question about disparities, I think I, I alluded to in the, in, the, in the talk there. But, you know, cardiovascular disease is the biggest killer now around the world. And in, in many countries, in Africa and, you know, every continent in the world, there's close to one cell phone per, per person. And so if we can use that technology, uh, and we can potentially do something to global health that, uh, that uses high technology. And that, that's a fairly new thing. Questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Kyle, and my question really is about data integrity, because I can see places where it matters, and I can see places where it doesn't matter, and how are we addressing that? So, for example, with Yuri's, you know, I'm the one who leaves the cell phone when I exercise, so I'd be a horrible data point for your, your particular study. So how do we address data integrity sort of across these range of applications? Uh, excellent question. Uh, you know, it took us... Uh, um, I, we actually did, I think at the end it was 48 different alternative hypotheses of why what we find is not true, and we couldn't make it disappear, so we had to conclude that it's true. Um, but, uh, it, and I think like in some sense, right, data integrity, um, right, so here our findings were published in Nature, we got, I think, rejected four times because um, it was like too novel and kind of too much new stuff, and every time they rejected, we came back and said, no, no, you cannot reject us, this is too cool, can we, can we rebut? And we rebutted, and, and it went back and forth, and we were almost ready to give up, but then they said, okay, you are accepted. 
right? Um, but I mean, may, maybe what did we learn from that, right? It's like it's very hard to talk about de data integrity in abstract. Um, you can talk about it a bit, but then at some point in time, it's really like, what are you trying to do with that data and what are you trying to show? And in that particular use case, how do you demonstrate that your inferences are valid, right? And for example, in our case, it was, uh, you know, uh, oh, it's just, uh, you know, uh, uh, poor people don't have cell phones. Women don't wear cell phones. Uh, uh, women sleep uh, about half an hour or an hour longer than men. Um, uh, you know, um, people don't have cell phones in their pockets. But there are all, like, there was 52 of these types of objections, but for each one of them, we were basically able to go in and say, no, this does not matter, this does not explain it, and so on, right? So, for example, for people not wearing cell phones in pockets, what you can do is, some people have cell phones, have also watches. So now you can compare the step count on your watch versus what your cell phone measures. And, and you can try to correct that. Then, right, like the population is a bit biased. But again, you know your population in the study, but you can kind of reweigh it to measure the census data. Then, for example, you can say that, let's say, the differences we see are not due to walkability, but really due to uh, different socioeconomic status. But what you can, for example, do is you can look at people who move. You can take a New Yorker who, for some reason, moved to Texas. And you see how much do they walk in Texas versus what they did in New, in New York. And you can take a very, you know, you can take a Texan and see what happens when they move to Boston. Do they walk more or not? And, and you can kind of get to, 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 support, uh, to support the claims. But I wouldn't say there is, there is an easy way. I think it's very kind of question application dependent and it takes lots of time and work. Uh, but it's very important, right? Because that makes between like, you know, cute, a difference between acute observation and effect. Yeah, I would just, just add that we were dealing with very similar questions, and uh, there was always this purse versus pocket question. You know, surely, you know, women hold, have their, their smartphone in their purse, and men have it on their person. And, you know, we looked for that effect in our study, too, and, and we couldn't find it. You know, we were also asking individuals, we could, we could ping them on the app and say, did, did we miss anything today? Was there a time you went out running, but your cell phone was somewhere else? And there was also no difference between, between men and women. But, but it's, it's something that we spend, I mean, it's, a, it's an amplification of what we've known in, in data science forever, that you spend 95% of your time beating up on the data to, to, and, and, you know, in the very small moment at the end doing the final analysis. Uh, so that hasn't changed, if anything. Maybe it's become even more extreme than it was before. Excellent question on data problems. Other questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. So I have a question on um, whether we have a um, a duty to sort of provide a disclosure on the data collection and how that can be used in a potentially adverse way against that person who gives you that data. So I think whatever you mentioned in this presentation that people don't want to be monitored in, ge in general. But we know that you know Uber drivers and all these um, car sharing drivers, they give out their driving behavior you know, for the near time, maybe for you know, better insurance pricing, et cetera. But eventually you're training the autonomous vehicles to, be, you know, uh, to replace them. So do we have that sort of social moral responsibility to have that you know, this disclosure that you um, presented at the beginning that this could potentially harm you? <laughs> Miranda writes your data can and will be yeah, yeah. against you. Um, Questions? Who wants to tackle? Nope. <laughs> um, I think it's a good idea, but it's I think very difficult because the the date the use of data also evolves with time. So um, so you might have one application in mind when you collect the data, um, but data can speak many languages, and over time, as more and more data scientists look at it, they might squeeze additional information out of the data. So in theory, I think it's a it's a good practice, a good idea, but I'm not really sure how you would really be able to implement that. 